Uh, first of all, there are Professor Lawrence Wu, Board of Directors, Singapore International Mediation Center, as well as Mr. Kirin Deep Singh, Senior Partner, Denton's Wright and Davidson LLP. Maybe let me first start by doing an introduction of Prof. Wu. Uh, Professor Lawrence Wu is a pioneer in the development of Singapore arbitration and is closely linked to the SIAC since its founding in 1991. He is one of Singapore's leading international arbitrators. Having sat as arbitrator in more than 350 cases and written numerous arbitral awards. He has also mediated over 100 disputes. Professor Bull leads the teaching of international commercial arbitration at the Faculty of Law, National University of Singapore since 1994. <clears throat> he also teaches at Bond University, Australia. Maybe now let me also introduce Mr. Kirin Deep Singh. Uh, Mr. Kirin Deep Singh is a senior partner in Denton Strikes Litigation and Dispute Resolutions and Arbitration Practice Group and is the co-head of the firm's construction and international trade practices. His primary practices area include construction engineering, arbitration, general civil and commercial litigation. Mr. Kirin has been involved in numerous disputes in adjudication, dispute boards, arbitration and litigation, both as counsel as well as adjudicator and arbitrator in ASEAN and various countries in Asia, Africa, Europe, U USA, as well as the CIS countries. So we are very pleased to have them both with us today to share their insights on how disputes can be resolved in an efficient and cost-effective manner through alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, for this fireside chat, we also welcome questions from the floor. So if any of the participants, if you wish to ask a question, please type them in the chat function. I will then direct your questions to the relevant speakers for them to respond and share their expertise on this particular topic towards the end of the fireside chat. But while you are typing in your question, please do state your name uh, as well as organization before asking the questions. So without further ado, maybe let me just start the fireside chat now. Mr. Ko, um, before we proceed to the fireside chat, will it be okay if we have a quick photo op with our participants and the panelists? Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. My colleagues from the Capacity Building Vision will help me capture the photos. All right, let's do a quick photo op. One, two, three, smile. Another one. One, two, three, smile. Right, thank you. Turning over to <laughs> Thank you Mr. very much, Yael. So, so uh, maybe let me just start the conversation going. I think, uh, Lawrence and Kirin, I think in the past couple of years, there have been a lot of borders control. I mean, with the pandemic situation still running rampant uh, globally and especially in Asia, even though we have lifted some uh, of the of the measurements, safe distance measurements in Singapore just yesterday. But I think the border controls have been around the world for quite some time now to contain the spread of COVID-19. Um, and I think face-to-face -face meeting has been challenging. I was just mentioning, I mean, we are starting to have more and more face-to-face uh, interactions, but I think in the course of the past two to three years, this has been challenging. So we'd like to understand from you guys uh, in your respective areas, from an arbitrator point of view, as well as a legal counsel point of view from Kirin, uh, how has this affected the resolution of cross-border disputes in the last couple of years? Maybe I can first invite uh, Lawrence to, to share your views on this. Yeah, sure. First, let me just say how pleased I am to be able to uh, join this session. Um, but also to lay some background that Singapore has a very comprehensive ADR environment, starting from the formation of Singapore International Arbitration Center, then the Singapore Mediation Center, the SIMC, and more recent years, the SICC, Singapore International Commercial Court. But one thing about this setup that we have, the ADR environment in Singapore, is that it's very much location-based, another physical presence of parties. So the COVID-19 situation has uh, caused a disruption at least for the first six months, it has caused a massive disruption. Hearings uh, and arbitration and mediations have to be postponed. Uh, but uh, fortunately for us, so it's only for about six months uh, because the due to the uncertainty as to when the pandemic is going to end, um, uh, parties then began to be uh, to re revive hearings and um, uh, new. Uh, the crafted online hearing protocols and uh, 
And as, a, as such, there's a revival after six months, you know, slow revival, you know, it was resuscitated and the momentum got going. For arbitrators and mediators, I think the uh, COVID-19 situation, in fact, has uh, hastened the use of technology. Uh, paper bundles uh, have become e-bundles. Arbitrators and mediators uh, have to, got to learn to uh, work digitally, got to learn to use e-bundles, online exchange and sharing of documents. So now sessions of hearings and uh, mediations are almost paperless. In fact, uh, and there's one thing that went out of fashion altogether, went obsolete, and that's telephone conference. We used to have a lot of telephone conferences, but it's totally obsolete now. We're all Zoomers now, not baby doomers, but baby Zoomers, you know. So no longer, um, one thing that we've experienced is that um, hearings may get a little bit more tiring because we are staring at screens all the time, four or five screens each time often, much like those traders. Yeah, you have transcripts, you have... Uh, witnesses, you have conferences. So we do get jet lag without traveling. So it's like that's experience of arbitrators and mediators following um, uh, the, uh, as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. But one thing is, one thing I can say that has uh, not suffered is that uh, the ADR world is as active as before. There are no less cases, there are no less arbitrations. Um, hearing has become easier to arrange in a sense that people can come online from different jurisdictions at different time zones. So it is something that I thought is, um, is a positive in that sense. But I think with the easing of the uh, uh, pandemic restrictions, the fiscal hearings are starting to come back. That's my experience at the moment. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Lawrence, for, for that uh, overview. I think beyond um, the dispute resolution type of mechanisms, I think uh, globally for any kind of meetings and all that, we have been switching uh, more to a virtual setting. And uh, as you mentioned, I think things are starting to come back to, to um, where it was before and there are more and more uh, physical uh, interactions uh, coming along. Maybe before I switch over to, to Kirin, um, uh, maybe, maybe let me just say, switch over to Kirin to see what is your views on this, Kirin. Yeah, just to uh, just to uh, elaborate on, on, on you know what Lawrence has said. Uh, I mean, there was the initial delay, initial delay where you know if you if you look at the court context, I I know of colleagues who were in the middle of a trial and when the circuit breaker hit Singapore and we had to go into everyone had to quarantine themselves, so called. Now hearings were immediately like. You know, the, the next day, you one day you were there, the next day you were gone. And um, there was an initial delay, but the but then all of the, I mean, the courts included and the arbitral institutions, they adjusted very quickly. And we proceeded quite quickly. Um, I think there was that six months that Lawrence mentioned to online dispute resolution. Now, if you look at the arbitral institutions, they've also been quite uh, efficient here. They've come up with several protocols you have the ICC guidelines, you have the uh, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center also came up with guidelines for virtual hearings. You had the Seoul Protocol, which was uh, you know, enacted by the Arbitration Center in Seoul. And they quickly came up with various guidelines to uh, address issues such as cybersecurity, how you examine witnesses and experts, uh, the venues that you could use, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the world adjusted very quickly and we proceeded quite quite seamlessly. And Lawrence is right. I mean, telephone conferences um, were the norm before, especially with arbitrators and, and uh, you have direction hearings. It used to be over telephone conference. But I mean, Lawrence, interestingly, I had one uh, videoless, videoless Zoom for some reason. The, the arbitrators had a, had a telephone con I mean, they had a Zoom call, but they asked us all to turn off our videos. I don't know why. Maybe the arbitrator wasn't well-dressed or something. Um, <laughs> And uh, that proceeded like a telephone conference. So overall, it's um, actually just to echo what uh, uh, Lawrence has said, uh, not only just as busy as before, but in fact, for myself, I can say it's even more busy uh, during the COVID period. Uh, because now you don't have to struggle with getting everybody to the same venue. Um, you know, there people have no excuses for being away from the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the scheduling of hearings became far more easy uh, because people didn't have to travel, which is why I think a lot of uh, my fellow litigation colleagues or arbitration colleagues 
we actually found ourselves more busy than before. Right. Right? Yeah, on the dedication front. Yeah. I may just add on actually, I, I mentioned earlier about the experience of institutions here. The SIMC, for example, has seen an increase in caseload. You know, pre-COVID uh, was lower, post-COVID was, I mean, we're still in COVID. It, the case numbers have just shot up. So there's a spike in the number of cases referred to mediation. And I want to underscore here mediation. A lot more people felt that, you know, um, under these challenging circumstances, maybe it's better to try alternatives instead of going for an adversarial process, they attempted mediation. So the SIMC has been busier uh, since 2020, 2021, and the cases have been uh, increasing, uh, inclu especially for international cases. Uh, there are two, two good examples. There was one uh, in cooperation with the Japanese, uh, uh, Japan International Mediation uh, um, Center, and uh, it was resolved online, fully online, involving parties who are not, not connected to Singapore. So it is a uh, very positive, in fact, the pandemic serves as a positive factor to urge parties to attempt uh, uh, settlement rather than engage in contentious litigation or arbitration. So there's also another case, uh, multi-party, five uh, parties from five different countries actually came together and they actually have a multi-jurisdictional mediation and was successfully settled all within a matter of days. So it is really a cost-saving thing for them. And there's a great positive experience of many parties who engage in uh, big value disputes during this period. Yeah. So, so actually, I think for both Lawrence as well as Green, I mean, you, you guys both touched on a, a, a few points. So one of these points is that actually uh, the, ent the entire industry actually moved very quickly using technology as a key enabler to, to switch from a pure physical type of um, interactions to a virtual type of interactions. And that has proved quite effective. Of course, there were also instances whereby uh, people not familiar with technology was using certain um, picture of themselves on the <laughs> on the web. And then the judge was talking to, a, 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 if I'm not mistaken, a dog or something like that as a picture. <laughs> but but okay. I think te te technological hiccups always occur. But I wanted to drill a little bit into uh, the other point was that while we have shifted quite rapidly into uh, technological usage, but both Lawrence as well as Kirin, you mentioned that actually it has been as effective or, or even more effective. And I think Kirin, just now you mentioned that um, you have been much busier uh, with much more cases that you are able to handle and all that. So the effectiveness has gone up. And I think both of you just explained quite a number of uh, reasons why that actually took place, whereby people are more willing to come in together. Maybe let me delve a little bit deeper into this. I am pretty sure that there are both pros and cons in any, any situation. So while, while the process has been more effective, I'm just wondering because sometimes face-to-face -face type interaction is important. The relation as well as interactions between um, human physical human beings in a physical setting is quite important as well. So other than the effectiveness, do you see any downside whereby the face-to-face -face, uh, couldn't take place as well as the relationship between people couldn't take place? Has that impacted the process in any way? Starting maybe, okay, maybe let, let Kirin say something first, yeah. I tend to all of a sudden jump in unnecessarily. <laughs> no problem, no issue. Just, just two very quick points. One is, because of the virtual hearings, for us, I think seated in, based in Singapore, uh, I mean, more so for the Australians and New Zealanders, if you're dealing with a dispute or arbitration which is seated in Europe or in the US, then you got to contend with crazy hours, wow. right? You know, um, I had an arbitration, two arbitrations and one dispute board hearing, which um, three in a row, and it was from 4 p.m. Singapore time all the way up to 11.30 p.m. Singapore time. And then thereafter, you know, you have to have your discussions with your clients. You have to prepare for the next day. So we often went back at about 2 a.m. in the morning, you know, back in the office again at 10 o'clock at the latest to prepare for the next day. So it was quite um, quite punishing that way. So that is something I say is not very efficient because it was quite tiring. Uh, those in Europe and US, of course, had the advantage. Yes. And, and the second point is the, um, the uh, benefits of cross-examination, right? Um, 
I think I, I don't know whether Lawrence, being a very experienced arbitrator, would agree. I think there's nothing that can substitute actually interacting with the witness in person from a counsel's point of view. And I just finished a two-week trial where I, it was so refreshing that I could actually examine the witness in person, up, cro up close and personal, you know. And uh, it was, I think, more effective overall, both for counsel and for the judge. And one problem with virtual hearings, and, and then I'll hand over to, to Lawrence, is that you don't know whether there's any witness prompting that's going on. You don't know whether the witness, I mean, you can have 360 cameras and all that, but not many people have that, you know. Um, you don't know whether the witness is looking at some WhatsApp chat group, you know, uh, online at the moment, on another screen that we can easily do. So there is that disadvantage, and I think we still have to um, address that comprehensively. So that's the, the disadvantage. I, I think um, in-person hearings are still uh, very beneficial. Thank you. I, I, yeah, I'll jump in here. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Queen Deep a bit, quite a bit in terms of that. Uh, of course, it's all, always better to be in person because you can feel the presence of the person. You can read his body language. You can um, uh, interpret them the way yeah, you can from, from tribunal or mediator's angle. Uh, that is missing, except that it's, it's, it's compensated uh, on the other hand, sorry, uh, uh, it's counterbalanced on the other hand by the fact that uh, witnesses or people speaking into the camera, uh, they, you can see them full frontal in the sense that you can see the full face and their expressions and their grins or their whatever uh, facial expressions. Yeah, so it is sometimes that also has been, has been is a positive as well. So it's all sort of balance of, um, of course, the, the, the presence of human beings in a room does make the uh, situation a little bit artificial sometimes that you're speaking to a screen. In fact, you're speaking to a camera. And um, the fact that um, witnesses can be seen itself is good, but not good enough. Yeah. But having said that, having said that, in terms of mediation, the, uh, the number of cases that actually succeeded in mediation in terms of rate of success have not dropped. You know? So based on SIMC's figures, the 70 to 80% success rate is still highly, is well maintained. So in terms of mediation, I don't think that, uh, in terms of arbitration, I think you are right in the sense, he's right in the sense that cross-examination may be a bit more challenging for counsel. And, uh, but at the end of the day, it is, the, it is um, still better than not having hearings, not having a, uh, and, and, and also the net result is arbitrators do have more time, frankly, to uh, write the awards. They don't have to travel, they save a lot of time, so they can deliberate online and they can start writing the awards. Awards do come up, quite, quite a lot of awards were issued, I must say, on my part for my, and my colleagues. Uh, quite a lot of awards came out during the uh, pandemic period because we, we cannot travel, we don't have too much spare, uh, too much uh, downtime in that sense from travel. And so we uh, spent a lot of time writing the awards and decisions came out faster in that sense. So efficiency have not dropped. Except that we have jet lag, as I say, without traveling. You know. Just very quickly, Lawrence, this one interesting <laughs> thing to share. I don't know whether as arbitrator you've noticed. Um, I noticed that council have commented on other council's expression. You know, because the video is so clear, you have like, oh, uh, council so and so looks, uh, uh, you know, doesn't seem to be agreeing. You know, he seems to be shaking his head, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or you get sarcastic remarks like, you know, I would appreciate if Mr. So-and-so would not shake his head and prop the witness or something like that. And all of that is front and center on Zoom, you see. Whereas in court or in arbitration, you, you have to look sideways maybe. or or uh, uh, but, but in Zoom, you have everybody there. So I, I think increased number of comments of that of that sort, just, just as on the, on the lighter side of things. True, and it's all recorded huh, on video. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I tend, I tend to agree with this. So actually, productivity and efficiency have increased tremendously because of all this usage of technology. You don't have to travel and you can write whatever documentation that is required. But the unfortunate thing and downside to that is really, I think, the amount of hours that people um, working in a way has actually intensified quite a lot. And I think that actually leads to quite a number of um, tiredness and 
happen now and all that because even within the Singapore um, legal industry, I mean, there were certain reports just recently that actually a lot of the younger lawyers and others couldn't take it and decided to uh, to um, uh, go away from this particular industry. I mean, I, I don't think it's only the legal industry, but I think quite a number of the other industry. Before I switch tag uh, to talk about infrastructure, Maybe just one more one more point on this topic. So just now, I think both of you also mentioned that uh, within this space, actually increasingly people are more amiable to the idea of mediation. Um, and for some, I, I'm just wondering why has that taken place? Why, why is it that within um, the past two years, there is a increasing more awareness and, and desire to go into maybe mediation or arbitration rather than litigation to resolve some of the dispute that they're facing? Well, from my angle, I believe that uh, parties face challenging times during the last two years. Business in some sectors are down. Uh, construction in particular uh, and, um, uh, have um, suffered a little bit, although it will pick up, you know, because it's just held in appearance. And then uh, large companies are all challenged by uh, supply chain issues by uh, manpower issues and uh, so it, it, it um, so it does cause businesses to rethink whether or not they are whatever disputes they might be involved in whether it's worth investing even more money during challenging times into uh, what is what is often considered as negative return kind of uh, investment investing money into litigation or arbitration. So they, they therefore seek to find the uh, uh, easier way and a slightly more productive way to uh, find value from what's already negative. And so going to mediation with a high success rate, coming out with a solution that can help them tie through difficult times is something very palatable, I think, to big businesses. So I think this is the reason why I think mediation, international mediation, seen and picked up at least in SIMC during the last two years. So I believe it will, it will have its momentum. I think once businesses feel that um, there is a possibility of settling matters amicably, uh, albeit not the, uh, they don't get their, their power of flesh as such, but at least they get something um, uh, to help them going, uh, to keep them going. I think that is something that they work on. I think it's a very natural human thing to do instead of facing challenges head on, they decide to uh, minimize loss or cut loss and help hopefully that will bring them along the way safely. I suppose I suspect that's the push factor. Thanks, Lawrence. Maybe actually now, um, actually just nice for us to lead into the, 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 the topic because I think what uh, Lawrence had mentioned is that really for a lot of these uh, large firms, a lot of uh, um, complex uh, projects, for example, infrastructure projects, there has been a lot of issues with the industry, whether it's uh, schedule slippages, cost overruns, just now I think Lawrence mentioned manpower issues, um, material shortages and all that. And I guess um, what Lawrence had mentioned was that people are more willing to look at alternative um, dispute resolution mechanism rather than litigation. Mediation is one po one possibility, arbitration one possibility. I'm just um, maybe would like to hear from Kirin, what do you think are some of the other ways that the industry have been managing this particular risk that actually the sector has been uh, faced with? Yes. Well, I think uh, one, one encouraging part is people are having a look again at their contract conditions, right? So, they are trying to reach agreement on spreading the risks via the contract conditions. Instead of it, you know, for example, being so heavily weighted in favor of the owner, for example, um, I think this whole pandemic has brought people to the table where they try to, instead of going the litigation way, they know everyone is facing difficulties. So they ask themselves, let's try and adjust the contract conditions, right? So there is that movement there to, to, uh, reach agreement on contract conditions to spread the risks uh, instead of just one party bearing all the risks. For example, there could be adjustment to payment conditions. Um, I've seen cases where clients and contractors have respect, uh, relaxed payment, uh, payment conditions. Instead of paying monthly, maybe they agree to payments, if possible, being made fortnightly. Um, you also see uh, increased movement towards clauses that deal with material price changes. 
right price fluctuation clauses are becoming increasingly more common. Uh, indices that deal with inflation, right? These are things that are being incorporated into contracts because of the pandemic. And all of this reduce disputes, right? They reduce disputes. In, in, in the past, if, if there's a price increase, the contractor is often settled with it, right? You've taken the risk. I don't care if it's a five-fold, ten-fold increase. You've got to bear it. So people are looking more at incorporating material, uh, you know, price fluctuation clauses, indices in their, in their contracts. Some focus also on sharing of preliminaries, right? Uh, preliminary cost sharing, sharing the cost of uh, main contract uh, preliminaries, that is also something that's being looked at. So uh, all of this is, I think, the best way to just sum it up. The best way to address all of these issues is in the contract, right? You deal, it, deal with it in the contract because if it's all dealt with in the contract, then there is less scope for, for disputes. Less scope for disputes in that sense. So my, my advice to a lot of uh, parties here who are in the infrastructure sector, look at your extension of prime clauses, look at your variation clauses, see that they are comprehensively drafted, right? And my encouragement to owners, I mean, don't, don't tilt your contract so one-sided in your favor because I think the pandemic shows that it has been counterproductive. So try and even out the risks. And also, last point uh, is make sure you have a force merger clause in the contract. <laughs> right? I mean, we've dealt with situations where people have no force merger clause. Um, they've got no, no opportunity to suspend the contract. The only thing they can do is to appeal to the goodwill of, of the other party or terminate the contract or, or, say the, or, or, or deem the contract to be frustrated, which is not something that they want. So make sure you have force merger clauses in your contracts. So uh, I hope I've answered your question, John Tiang. On, uh, Perfect. Perfectly, perfectly. I, 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 still, I still remember that in the early stages of the pandemic, actually, there were a lot of uh, issues for contractors to actually fulfill their, their requirements. And I think the Singapore government actually um, undertook certain uh, legislation right at the onset, um, uh, special legislation just to ensure that certain contracts that were entered just prior uh, to the pandemic situation, they were able to, I can't remember, I think they were able to extend it out uh, yeah. for a couple of years, uh, or one year or two years or something like that. And they were able to uh, 122 days. 122 days. 122 days. <laughs> why so specific? 122 days. I don't know why. <laughs> I think you 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 take away the, the you take away the weekends or something. I don't know how they arrived at, at something so precise. 120, 122, something like that, which is an automatic extension granted. Uh, and it happened a few times. It's not just once. It happened a few times. The latest one was 122. Um, and um, so it's a uh, the maths behind it. I I'm not I'm not sure. <laughs> but in, in this particular case over here, because that's now I think one of the points that uh, Kirin, I think you mentioned quite strongly on was really in any such projects, in any contracts, there will be a stronger party and there will be certain price taker uh, in such a contractual terms. And more often than not, the contractual terms are tilted towards the, the party that has the, the uh, bigger bargaining power and unfortunately that will lead to certain uh, issues subsequently. In this particular case over here, government generally have um, better bargaining power and I, I guess uh, in this particular instance in Singapore at least, the government decided to, to seat some of this bargaining power to ensure the industry still survive. On this topic, Lawrence, do you have any views? I certainly have a little bit, although I'm no, no expert or um, too much experience in infrastructure projects, but I know that in big infrastructure projects, there are a lot of inherent risks. Some are reasonably foreseeable, some are totally unforeseen. And of course, the unforeseen ones will fall within the no-fault zone of force majeure. Um, I would like to suggest that when um, it comes to minimizing or avoiding delays and disputes, it's important that parties take a realistic view of risk allocation. Yeah, When you're contracting, as, as you said, you know, the uh, Local government agencies or the the, uh, the employer, the public sector undertaking, would love to throw all the um, risk on the contractor or their private partner, depending on the, the arrangement. Yeah, whether PPP or is it a uh, 
a con purely contract. And to throw all the risks onto the uh, contractor or the partner itself and have, um, uh, is, may not be the wisest thing to do because they may have a different competency set and different solvency risk. So it is therefore, uh, I, I would suggest that government uh, undertakings or I think in Philippines you call LGU or local government units uh, or, or public undertaking, be careful that in risk allocation, do so objectively so that the best party who is able to manage that risk undertakes that risk. And then they can price it properly. You know, if you throw everything to the contractor or to the private sector partner, then they bear all the risk, the price is going to go up. And if they cannot handle it, who is going to bear the risk? At the end, you'll be stuck with a project that cannot be completed. And I thought completion of, uh, of the project is the primary objective of any big project. It's most important that it's completed successfully within time with minimum delay. How to achieve that is to allocate the risk carefully, not to lump everything to one side. So I, I, I picked this up from what you said earlier, that the government tends to be the paying party and therefore they want to, uh, uh, the other side, adopt the risk. So sometimes certain risk can be absorbed by the, the uh, public sector. For example, if there is a certain resource that is available only through licensing or through leasing, or through uh, 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 import permits, all this can be can be exercised by the government. So why not the government takes the uh, take the risk? So it's something that uh, uh, government units got to rethink. Yeah, most government think that they want to throw the risk to the other side. They got to rethink now in this uh, uncertain um, world uh, economic development. One must also uh, situation like that. One must rethink how we contract. With the private sector, yeah. So I, I suggest that um, is to avoid a single, also to avoid a single contractor. Sometimes it's the too big to fail kind of scenario, and then you'll be stuck with a failing a main contractor, and instead of passing on to the smaller one. And I like what the previous speaker suggested. I think he came up with various possible scenarios of dispute management. In case there's a dispute, what happens? Manage the dispute. You do not always need to go to. Uh, arbitration or court litigation. So I think the, uh, what the previous speaker just before our session shared was would have been very useful, which I think is one of those solutions that uh, all government uh, PPP contractors all must look into it. <clears throat> I think we are touching um, a very important topic over here. Maybe let me just, uh, just delve a little bit deeper into this particular topic again, because I think in terms of government contracting, which was the example that we've been using, uh, risk allocation is important. But actually for PPP type of project, risk allocation become even more imperative because yes. uh, I think Lawrence just now was mentioning that actually at the end of the day, what is the objective of the government to ensure that the projects get completed in, in time on, in, on target? And the issue is not really about... Um, ensuring that you are totally protected and to the detriment of the accomplishment of the project. So on this particular topic, I would like to ask Kirin, in your, in your work that you have done, are there certain, whether it's government contracting project or a PPP type of projects, whereby risk was actually allocated not in the correct way and that actually caused to the disruption of the particular project or caused certain issues arising from it? Yes, uh, there have been several instances. Actually, I was just about to add to what Lawrence mentioned. Um, I think Singapore, we, I, I wouldn't say we are there yet, but we learned uh, the hard way. Uh, I think you think back, uh, John Tiang, you may be, or Lawrence, you may be familiar, maybe 15 years ago or something, there were a lot of contractors going under. A lot of contractors, I think if you remember headlines in the Straits Times, uh, upgrading project in this area in Singapore for the, for, for the Philippines audience called Marine Parade, where a contractor just withdrew. Uh, you know, and that brought to the forefront how one-sided actually the government contracts were. And uh, the, the contractors were being saddled with a lot of the risks. Um, also, another instance is, I think you'll remember the stand ban in Singapore. Uh, you know, where we were, we, Singapore for, for Philippine uh, audiences, we, we, we've got no natural resources, right? We are, we are tiny, tiny islands. So we, we are dependent on natural resources from other countries. And we used to import a lot of sand from uh, Malaysia and Indonesia because sand is an important component for concrete, right? And um, there was a sand ban 
um, imposed by Malaysia and Indonesia, and that had a tremendous impact on our contractors as well as our suppliers. Uh, that also, I think the government had to step in and the government had to provide some kind of reprieve. Uh, they had to uh, free up their, their, their stockpile of, of sand for the contractors. So all of these lessons, I think um, these are very public kind of lessons that showed that it's not really worth it having your contract tilted in favour of the owner. Right? And I've seen it happen also recently um, I think in other other public sector projects, I can't name them, but where the risk of the supply of getting the components was on the contractor. And then you have a COVID-19 situation where it's nobody's fault, right? And the government has come back to the negotiating table, amended the contract terms to ensure that there's some kind of fairness towards the contractor. So all of these situations I have encountered and it's not very productive for the government because what happens is if you don't have, like Lawrence has said, you don't have a properly balanced contract, it's going to lead to a dispute because you're going to push the contractor to a corner. The contractor will think, I am not going to spend all this money. I'm going to take my risk at arbitration. Okay, I'd rather pay my lawyers, right, a few hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is to fight this dispute, to get my dues rather than, <laughs> rather than uh, um, um, you know, incur all these millions in, 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 in trying to meet my contractual obligations. And, you know, often I've seen contractors appealing and appealing, you know, and, 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 and one side always saying, no, this is what the contract says, this is not, this is what the contract says, and that leads to disputes. So we, you, this, this thing that, that Lawrence emphasized on risk allocation is very, very important. And it is the first port of call uh, for trying to avoid disputes, right? If this is all properly allocated. I mean, I think later on we can touch on the dispute adjudication boards. I, I, can, I can touch on that uh, later on as well, uh, which is another method that we can use to manage, uh, like what the previous speaker said, speakers said manage, manage disputes rather than bring them to arbitration or litigation. Mm. Yeah. So um, maybe let me just add in a point to this. Because uh, we are not saying that actually the, um, the, cor the contract should be balanced for the sake of it being balanced. But the word is really proper risk allocation. I mean, in the case that, Karin, I think you mentioned about the sand, is that the contractor actually have no, no way to actually manage the, the sand issue because they are not the one that is going to import the, the sand. So it is totally not within their control. And you're asking them to manage a risk, which is totally not within their control. There's absolutely no way they are going to do that. So I don't know, Lawrence, have you encountered a, a, any such situation where risk allocation was totally, um, it, it just totally mismatched and, and yeah. caused any issues? Yeah, I, but that, that's, that's not in relation to Singapore. Uh, I had I had situations in uh, in a neighboring country where, you know, the risk of importing labor, for example, taking labor from, uh, from another country for a massive project and um, where they had to build camps for the laborers, but the control of labor is also controlled by the government because the import of labor, uh, number of permits to have how many people coming into the country is all controlled by the local government. And therefore the uh, contractor cannot start work, contractor delayed. So because it's a chicken and egg situation, you know, the, the contractor has no, just like the sand the, uh, issue, situation in Singapore, the contractor has was not able to uh, uh, complete a project because the, the local government is not giving, uh, the, the central government is not granting the permits for the import of those labor and skilled laborers, engineers. So it caused that problem. You know? The risk, but the contractually, the risk is with the contractor or the private partner. So that, that is an example, very easy example of how it's done. For Singapore, fortunately, I must say that based on public records that I know of, Singapore's public sector had not much disputes from infrastructure projects. The only two cases that I can recall, the Brani Naval Base case, which went to arbitration, the building on Naval Base in Pula Brani, went to arbitration in the 1980s. The last case that I remember, Singapore infrastructure contract that went to arbitration, <coughs> government and the, uh, the partner is the CTE arbitration, CTE, Central Expressway, and that was in the 1990s. So I think the uh, Singapore government style of risk allocation, I think has improved a lot. Uh, uh, and the steps they have taken in recent years 
is indicative of the attitude. You know, I think that is uh, dispute management. That is trying to minimize or reallocate risk. But it would be even better had it been in the contract itself, not after a, a problem has arisen. So if it is in the contract itself, then the government does not need to legislate. The government does not need, need to, uh, they'll just take it upon, them, upon themselves to uh, uh, get the sign in. You know? So it's something that um, uh, a lot more enlightened and bold government can do. But yeah, there's a political risk there, you know? Yeah, because political risk is sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the lecturer will say, why are you treating foreigners or foreign contractors or the private sector more better when you, you don't have to? So there is something that you got to be balanced with. Right. So that's all I'd say, thanks. Just, just to give uh, uh, some reality check on the, the, the sand thing, right? I mean, the cost of importing sand at that point, I remember, was only $5 uh, per cubic meter from Malaysia and Indonesia. And uh, when the ban came in, the contractors would, would have to go as far as Myanmar uh, or Vietnam, etc., to get the sand. And that would be 50, 60, as much as $70 per cubic meter. So you can just think, you know, about the, the, the cost difference. And, and just to very quickly elaborate on what Lawrence just said, um, you know, when you, I, maybe the, the, the uh, Philippines can identify with this. If you have a, I had a, I had a project for overhead power transmission lines. And when you, when you build overhead power transmission lines, they run across residential areas, they run across villages and all that in a particular country in Eastern Europe. So these, these, residents had to be relocated and they had to be compensated. And that is something, just to echo what Lawrence said, it's something that is can be very well controlled and managed by the government, not by the contractor, right? And for, for an instance like this, the risk should be on the government, right? Because they are the ones who can compensate, they are the ones who can move the people, they are the ones who know the terrain of the country, um, rather than settling the risk on a overseas contractor, who doesn't have that kind of influence in those sort of situations. So unfortunately, I think this is actually a very key issue in many infrastructure projects, whereby uh, the clearance of land and the acquisition of the land and resettlement of the population is a topic that is best actually controlled by the government. But unfortunately, most governments do not want to take the political hit to that. And then that is why they try to um, allocate it actually to the to the um, other party, the private sector party, yeah. which absolutely have no control. And actually, this is one of the major issues uh, uh, regarding the, the field implementation of a lot of infrastructure projects. So actually, we need a PPP realm. Maybe let me also quote an example because Infrastructure Asia has been working with quite a lot of um, waste to energy plant in this region. Now, waste to energy plant, you need the feedstock, you need the rubbish to be actually burnt. Of course, in the Philippines, I don't think it's still allowed. But in Singapore, for example, when we first did it uh, many, many, many years ago, we, it was actually a few example that we tried. We tried to force the private sector to actually um, have the responsibility of ensuring that the quality of the waste is there, the quantity of the waste is there. And from the waste to energy plant owner, there's no way I can manage that. And actually, I, if I remember correctly, the first waste to energy PPP project that Singapore tried to undertake, we were not able to find any international party that was willing to take that project up at all because they know that they totally cannot manage the risk. <laughs> but unfortunately, for the waste to energy project that we are seeing across the region, this is still the case whereby government will try to allocate this particular risk to the private sector. And unfortunately, it leads the project to go nowhere. So maybe let me switch topic again, because just now I think uh, we were mentioning a lot about uh, various dispute resolution mechanism. So unfortunate thing is that infrastructure projects are generally very long-term. It could spend decades from planning to operations and end of life. And the reality is this, that I think throughout its life cycle, in one point or another point, there will be certain uh, dispute that arises and mechanisms are defined uh, to deal with it. And I guess we have touched on quite, I mean, the previous speaker have touched on a lot about uh, mediation as well as arbitration and how do you actually move between the two? Actually, I would just like to maybe, uh, first of all, from Lauren's point of view, because just now you mentioned that Singapore actually have a whole suite. How, does they, how do they interact with one another to give a good conclusion to some of this dispute that actually arises? 
Okay, thank you. I think more importantly is that we do have a full suite and of course it covers different phases uh, or, or stages of the uh, uh, of uh, any growing dispute. Yeah, but for particularly for infrastructure, we have the SIDP that was uh, introduced, I think, in 2018. There's sort of, for infrastructure disputes, um, there is a protocol in which uh, contractors or parties to uh, infrastructural contracts or, or, or projects are encouraged to adopt so that in the event of a dispute, you do not escalate straight away to arbitration or litigation or take injunctions to stop the contract uh, performance so that there will be no stoppages as such, minimize stoppages, minimize delay. So the SIBP put together a suite of possible uh, options for uh, an es the, a slow escalation of the, uh, for slow resolution and slow escalation of the dispute. Okay, a quick re uh, early resolution, sorry, and a slow escalation of the dispute by, you know, having what uh, the previous speaker also spoke about it, and that is the dispute uh, review board or the dispute, uh, just dispute board, whatever name is called. Basically, it is on the ground, uh, a permanent, uh, permanent in the sense that it is attached to, to the project, a team that will be able to be called upon for ground level disputes that there's brewing on the ground, that you can resolve it there and then with a minimal fuss and so that the project can go on. So sometimes small problems can become big when you delay, uh, the, uh, dealing with it and it will be compounded, it will cause delay in the project and uh, if it's on a critical path, the whole project might be derailed, you know, so it is very important that uh, on the ground disputes be resolved by the DB as, as soon and as quickly as possible. And then if that, that cannot be, a DB can come with different methods, they can employ mediation st uh, style, they can do a grant an opinion, they can do a a direction or an order for it to be uh, complied with so that both sides can move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, no DB decisions are final, it's a temporary finality, but parties are bound to carry in, carry out the decision or the opinion based on good faith because we want the project to move on. The whole idea is no stop, keep going, you know, even if you slow down for a while, give it a push and keep going. So that's the role of the dispute board, not to make a final decision. Make a temporary decision, both parties comply with it, like it or not, move on. Yeah. And then you have, if, if there is real uh, uh, substantive dispute subsequently, you might want to attempt mediation before you go to arbitration. So these are all like slow, uh, uh, try to minimize the uh, escalation of the uh, cases that will lead finally to an adversarial process. And I think this is this ISIBP uh, is a very good uh, protocol in which I think big projects can be uh, can adopt to. In fact, it's recommended for projects that are like five hundred million dollars kind of thing. That um, before you you have a permanent uh, um, a team that's on standby, so to say, for any disputes, it's a DB. So I think that is something that I think the previous speaker already uh, alluded to. Uh, something that I think um, all big projects should consider because that will be saving a lot of time. It keeps things flexible. It gives neutral uh, uh, um, evaluation or, uh, or uh, directions for the uh, uh, expedition of the uh, uh, resolution of the dispute and expedition of the project and causing minimal delay. So I think this is something that um, uh, is proactive. Uh, you don't wait until big problem, then you go for arbitration or stop work. Okay. So it is something that uh, we, will, we will recommend that um, uh, anyone involved in a big projection consider. Yeah. So Lawrence, I think just now you mentioned uh, SIDP yes. and that would be the Singapore Infrastructure Dispute Resolution yes. Protocol. Yeah. So uh, for those that are, for the audiences that are, that are keen to find out more about the SIDP, I'm pretty sure that it would be somewhere uh, on the web somewhere. <laughs> yes, anyway, yes, I think yes. I'm pretty sure that we can find the link and we can actually send the link over to you. So it is actually a, a mechanism, a, a protocol in which how you can actually uh, do such dispute uh, resolution mechanism. It should be there and we can send it out to everybody. Yes. At this point, then, before I go to Kirin, because I think Kirin just now mentioned that he did have some experiences working on certain dispute boards and what were some of the learnings. Before I ask Kirin to elaborate on that, maybe can I just ask the audiences, so if any of you have any questions, uh, do type in the chat box and I can direct some of these questions to our speakers. Um, but do just let us know your name as well as organization 
uh, and do feel free to give us any questions that you'd like us to uh, tackle on. So maybe Kirin, at this point in time, can I just check in with you? Yes. So dispute boards or DRBs or DABs, um, one thing from my experience that, that parties should bear in mind, not bear in mind, but you shouldn't just pay lip service to that clause on DRB or DAB, right? Because why I encountered a situation where a client engaged me and said that, look, um, can you represent us in this DAB proceedings? I said, fine, can. And I asked them, can I see the clause? They showed me the clause. Then I say, okay, fine. Uh, who is the member of the DAB? Who are, who are the DAB members or the DRB members? And they said, uh, not appointed yet. And I said, uh, how many years are you into the project? And they said, three, three to four years. <laughs> so uh, they only appointed the DAB when the disputes got out of hand. Yeah. You know? Whereas the, 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 the basis behind the DRB clause, as John and Orange you have, you have alluded to, is that they should be there from the very beginning. They should be maybe either legal experts and industry experts. That's a good combination. Have them involved in the project from the very start. We familiarize them with the project and bring them in as and when disputes arise, which they can help you to manage. I think the key word there is manage. Whereas in this project, the DAB was brought in right at the end. So it was like a mini arbitration. Yeah. Okay? It was a five-day dispute board hearing, which was a mini arbitration with witnesses and all that. So defeats the purpose completely. right? And um, I think the DRB or DAB is better than, in a lot of contracts, you have this engineer's decision, where when you have a dispute, you refer it to the engineer or you refer it to the architect. Now, my personal view is I don't think that's very productive. Because very often the architect or the engineer is the agent of the owner. And it's just, you're just going to get the same decision. So DABs and DRBs, I think, are a better way because you have actually neutral parties who are objective and who are going to adjudicate the dispute. The last point is, I think, uh, on, the, on the dispute protocol, uh, just on the lighter side, I think it's a slow kill thing, you know, uh, because, that, I mean, this is, this is what I mean by slow kill. Many, many uh, uh, lay people are not experienced with dispute resolution. So you expose them to it bit by bit. You know, you go to DAB, you realize, you know, there's some inconvenience, you go to mediation, and then you think, oh my God, if, if, if DABs and, and mediations are really like that, I have to spend so much time, I have to brief lawyers, <laughs> do this and do that. I don't want to go for arbitration, I don't want to go for litigation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, I, I think that the, uh, the more lighter side of things or a more practical part. It's a slow kill thing. You, 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 you parties begin to realize that going to litigation or arbitration is going to be really expensive. It's going to be time consuming. It's going to be stressful. It's going to take away your people from the projects and making money to do what they're supposed to do. Right? So uh, that, that's why I think this slow process is, 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 is very, very uh, useful. Very useful. Yes. I might want to jump into what Kirin just said about um, uh, managing uh, DB or DAB decisions and uh, how to treat it not like a mini arbitration, you know. And uh, in fact, the experience in Singapore, not that we've been involved in any DAB matters, but some one or two cases went to court exactly over DAB decisions, you know. It's such a waste of time, you know? such a waste of court time. In fact, we went to the court of two, two times, two rounds. All on enforceability of DAB uh, involves only $16 million, one six. Yeah. And it went to a call appeal two times with millions of dollars in costs being spent, which at the end of the day, their decision is only a temporary finality. In other words, you got to pay and then it's adjusted at the end of the day. So it is uh, sometimes very counterproductive if, if parties see the dispute resolution as a very contentious thing, you know. It, it just got to learn to live with the fact that once it's made, go on with it, and then you adjust it at the end of the day. So yeah, don't treat it like a big end of the uh, world kind of litigation that you must win. Yeah. So I think the attitude of parties is important, including the government. Huh? Government must not believe that, uh, the government party must also be conscious that you must dare to make decisions and uh, sometimes decisions to pay is not very popular. Yeah, <clears throat> government officials sometimes feel that we cannot make a decision to pay because it's an admission of our wrong. That cannot be right because you have to look at things objectively. If, if there is a cause that we are contractually liable for, pay for it, 
or absorb it first and then have it decided subsequently at the arbitration. So don't, don't go into court for a DAB decision or DRB decision, you know? really waste time. I think two, a few very important points is raised over here about uh, DAB and DRB. Uh, really in the sense that whoever uh, implementing parties is looking to do this um, should take it very, very seriously. Uh, and because I think it, it may be something that is interesting and people try to do it when the, uh, a dispute actually arises. But unfortunately, then it is a bit too late. And then I think I, I like Kirin's point that it's really a slow boy. <laughs> Because, yeah, I mean, with all the issues they're going to face with it, you then you think twice, even three times before you try to go to a, a arbitration or go to litigation to actually solve, solve the problem. I th thought that was very interesting. Um, can I also just got one, uh, one other point on this? Um, have you guys seen, I mean, good examples of such usage of DRB or DAB, uh, especially in this region? I must personally say that I don't, I've never served on a DAB or DRB, although I've been, uh, I mean, I look at clauses of that sort because I, I'm at the end point, mediation and arbitration. Mm. So at the lower end, at the ground level, I'm not involved. Yeah, so I can't say that. Uh, but my attitude towards it is, it's always temporary finality. And so don't be too worried about it. Well, from my experience, Lawrence, um the DAB proceedings uh, have worked. Um, you know, this, this exposure of ignorant clients to what, you know, a litigation can be like. Um, you know, even, for example, if you win in a DRB hearing or you, you get a decision in your favor, the other side will often say, okay, I'm going to take it to arbitration. And what that results in is parties coming to the negotiation table. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've seen in, in many instances where it has led to a makeable settlement, that's right? Good. So that's, 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 that's how it's useful. I mean, one side wins, the other side threatens, saying it's not, it's temporary finality, it's not final, so don't think you won the war, right? You may have won the battle, you've not won the war, I'm going to take it to arbitration. Mm -hmm. They come to the settlement table and often it gets, it gets settled. And in the Singapore context, uh, for our Philippine audience, uh, we have a legislation called the Security of Payment Act, mm -hmm. uh, which has a statutory adjudication. That means in, in Singapore projects, if you have disputes on your progress claims, you can take it before an adjudicator and it's resolved in a matter of one or two months, right? And the adjudicator's decision is also temporarily final. It's not, it's not, it's, it's temporary. It's not, it's not a, a, a final decision. You can challenge it in court. You can challenge it in arbitration, depending on your dispute resolution procedure. But I have seen that very often result in settlement. Right. Very often, you know, um, from a lawyer's business point of view, <laughs> you know, you don't get to go to arbitration, you don't go to litigation, right? Or, but it is from that point of view, as a lawyer uh, with over 20 years experience in construction, I have seen a number of disputes go to court or go to arbitration drop drastically because of the adjudication regime. I think, I think that's very important. I think, Karin, if you hit the nail uh, right there, because... Security for payment is so important because cash flow is the lifeline of contractors or your the parties doing the real work on the ground. And if the employer withholds payment, it, they're, they're going to kill the project and kill the contractor and kill the project. You know, so it is um, a suicidal if we don't withhold payment. But of course, there might be situations where there are genuine disputes as to whether they're entitled to the to the installment or the progress payment. So yeah. the security for payment. Uh, uh, provision or process is a very important one. I think, I think uh, I'm not sure whether Philippines have it, but it, if not, it's time for, for any country actually involved in big uh, infrastructure contracts to rethink um, uh, this, this regime. It thinks it's very good because I think the number of uh, construction cases that come to uh, arbitration now has dropped quite drastically, except in the very big mega projects where that might be end of the day arbitration. I think before SOP came to being, there were a lot of uh, such disputes and disrupt the construction progress, which is very bad. Yeah. So this is good. Thank you. That's, a, that's very unfortunate because disputes do really lead to delays in the project. There's one question from the chat box. Uh, maybe can I read it out and then invite Lawrence as well as Kirin to, to respond to this. Uh, the question is really, despite resort to the Trivex preparation in every contract, 
is it really possible that dispute arises due to language barriers? Uh, when he talks about the tribunal preparatory, it means the preparatory document to the uh, to the, the contract, right? Well, that, that helps in the interpretation of the uh, uh, contractual terms. And I think um, um, drafts and uh, the word uh, used are all important when it comes to interpreting and, and resolving the dispute at the final level, you know? Um, uh, so it is important, but uh, language can, uh, depending on the language of the, uh, of the arbitration or the language of the contract, uh, sometimes it can be due to uh, 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 language, but I think it's quite rare because if you're talking about infrastructure contracts, you're not going to have a broker drafting it. You're going to have teams of lawyers drafting it. The government lawyers, uh, and um, they will probably, there are standard forms. Of course, the problem is with years, sometimes the, the forms change. Contracts that with cut and paste provisions being changed. The, 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 the text or the wordings may conflict with each other or the interpretation or definition of one contract uh, when you cut the and paste may have a different meaning in this contract. So that is the role of the arbitrators and the courts to interpret the contract. So the tribunal preparatory is important, yeah, but um, it's not definitive or much depends on ascertaining the intention of the parties. I'm sure this is a very familiar term that Green Deep and I are all <laughs> always involved in ascertaining the intention of the parties. I've, I've seen it in one, only in one occasion, and it's many, many, many years ago. It was a dispute was pertaining to a wastewater treatment plant in Thailand. And uh, the contract in its ultimate form was in English, but it went through several drafts and there, were, there was a Thai language involved. And at the arbitration, I remember uh, some question being raised as to the translation. You know, there was something lost in the translation from the original uh, uh, Thai form. And when it made its way to the English form and the arbitration was in English. So there was disputes on the actual meaning of a particular clause as drafted in Thai and as it's drafted in, 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 in English. So that's the, that's the only situation I can remember many years ago where there was one issue that turned on, on, that, on that interpretation. So, uh, thank you very much for the question. I think we are almost coming, oh, actually we have crossed the one hour mark already, but maybe I would like just to check in with uh, Lawrence and Kirin. Um, I think um, increasingly uh, infrastructure projects, PPP in nature will become more and more important in a lot of countries and mm -hmm. also in the Philippines. So, do you have any views on how um, yeah, from a dispute resolution point of view, what can the country actually better do in order for it to be able to deliver its project much more smoother before I end the session? Lawrence? Just a simple one. I'm repeating myself. I think uh, government uh, units or agencies got to rethink risk allocation and to also think of how to manage uh, risk, if, uh, how to manage disputes when they arise. That's all. Yeah, it's something simple, but not easy to implement. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my point, I just echoes uh, the comment I see on, on the chat on the security of payment legislation. I think um, it has been very useful to Singapore. Uh, being uh, in construction law for a long time, I can testify to, to how successful it is. And I think uh, the Philippines should look at it. Uh, success stories coming out of Australia, New Zealand, UK, and uh, Malaysia also recently connected the, their own security of payment legislation. I think it's very important. It's very fair to contractors. There will be cash flow issues. And this uh, security of payment legislation is something that allows the contractors to, to, to deal with that cash flow issue uh, fairly quickly. And it's for the benefit of all parties. I mean, like Lawrence has said, the, uh, and yourself, Yuan Chang, you've said the project can go on, right? The contractor gets paid. Uh, in the PPP sector, the public, it gets the project gets delivered to the public, and at the end of the day, it's for the benefit of the public. Delays and disputes are also reduced. So I think uh, we we touch on quite a lot of things uh, in this just one hour. Uh, um, I think in terms of um, mediation and arbitration during the the COVID period, I think that's we have we have become more adept to using technology uh, in order to do some of these resolutions. But at the same time, I think for infrastructure projects, um, especially complex projects with long gestation period, 
I think uh, both of you touched on really risk allocation is actually of utmost importance because if risk is not allocated properly, there will be a lot of doubt. Uh, issues that will arise in the downstreams. And I think uh, both mediation, arbitration and litigation plays a role uh, in dispute resolution. But I think what you guys also mentioned is that dispute resolution board or dispute uh, board are actually very important mechanisms in which can be used to really address the issues really, really at its early stage. And but the critical thing to this is that you have to take it very seriously and it is something that you really want to implement right from the onset. And that's where how you make the mechanism uh, very effective. So thank you very much, Lawrence, as well as Kirin, for your very insightful sharing and interesting anecdotes uh, that you guys have. I hope that the audience enjoy it a lot as well. So maybe now I will hand the time back to Yayo from the Capacity Building Division of the PP Centre.